The second of these special functions that we'll now introduce is known as the delta function or the impulse function. This function represents a signal of infinite amplitude and zero duration. In other words, it lasts zero length of time, but in that zero length of time of duration, it has an infinite amplitude. <laughs> While this doesn't occur in nature, some events can be modeled as an impulse, such as the large, very brief voltage spike that's induced when an inductive circuit is suddenly opened or closed. We're going to define the delta function and call it delta of t in terms of the derivative of the step function. You'll recall how we defined the discontinuity of the step function at t equals zero, 0 using limits. And here we have it again. We've defined some small incremental value, epsilon, away from the origin. Prior to that it was 0, after that it's 0, and in between that interval the slope of that line was 1 over 2 epsilon. Since this function is piecewise continuous, we can define the derivative for it over each of those piecewise, piecewise sections. So the derivative here is just 0. The derivative here is 0. But in between the two epsilons, the derivative is the slope of this straight line. You'll recall the slope of the straight line was 1 over 2 epsilon. So in that interval, the derivative is a constant. The slope is constant in there. And so the height of this pulse is 1 over 2 epsilon. Now, if we allow the derivative, or the, if we allow the limit to, or apply the limit as epsilon approaches 0, the pulse gets narrower and narrower. And as the epsilon in the denominator here gets smaller and smaller, the pulse gets higher and higher. But note how, in this entire argument, the area of the rectangle is 1. In other words, the width is 2 epsilon, and the height is 1 over 2 epsilon. So the area of this rectangle, even as epsilon gets smaller and smaller, the height getting bigger and bigger and bigger, makes it so that the area is a constant value of 1. In the limit, the width of this pulse goes to 0. The height of the pulse goes to infinity. Graphically, we represent that as an arrow at the point of the discontinuity, the arrow suggesting that it is infinite, infinitely great in height, but again because it's zero in width, the zero times infinity gives us that constant area of one. We now then can define the delta function delta of t is equal to the limit as epsilon approaches zero of the derivative of the unit step function with respect to time. We can write it in its piecewise continuous form and say then that the delta of t is equal to 0 for t not equal to 0, and is equal to infinity for t equals 0. There are a number of interesting properties that go along with this very interesting function. And again, we're just introducing it at this time. We'll see how it's used a little bit later in the, in the class. And uh, this delta function then becomes a central part of, of describing sampling theory and taking analog signals and converting them to, to digital signals. You'll run into it a number of different places. So once again, here's our symbol for it. It's an, ar an arrow at the point of discontinuity. If you have discontinuities occurring at some other value, you'll have an arrow there. But the point is, is that the area, which is frequently just represented in terms of in, within parentheses, the area is 1. And as we already pointed out, there's the, the, the piecewise definition of it. It has an area of 1. Now what does that mean? What that means is that if you were to integrate the delta function, the area under it, or the value that you get, is equal to 1. So the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of delta of t dt is equal to 1. We can rewrite that because it only applies at the point of the delta function. And because it only exists at t equals 0, we could rewrite this as the integral from 0 minus to 0 plus of delta of t dt equals 1. And of course, it stands to reason, then, that as you're integrating up to 
the point where the impulse or the yeah the impulse function is it's zero at that point you then jump up one and thus in fact that is our unit step function u of t now we can scale the delta function by multiplying by a constant so k times delta t is a delta function with an area of k because k times infinity, if you're thinking of it and just multiplying the amplitude, that's not what's happening. You're actually multiplying the area. And so k delta t is a delta function with an area of k. Now, because the delta function, in this case, we're talking about delta of t minus a is a delta function out here at t equaling a, if this is 0, it only exists at t equals a. So if you have some function f of t multiplying a delta function at t equals a, you end up with a delta function that has the area or has an area equal to the value of the function at t equals a. So here we've got this continuous function f of t. We multiply it by a delta function located at t equals a. There is only one value of the function that's involved. Everywhere else, this is 0. So the product has only one point. The value of the function at that point is f of a times delta of t minus a. This, then, is a delta function with area f of a. This is not f of a, it's a delta function with an area of f of a. That leads us then to the final property we're going to discuss at this time, known as the sifting property. The sifting pro property simply stated is that if you integrate the product of some continuous time function f of t times a delta function, integrate it from minus infinity to plus infinity, you end up with f of a. This isn't a delta function of area f of a because we've integrated over it. We've determined what that area is. Let's look at it a little bit uh, more closely. Because this is only defined at t equals a, we can write this integral then as the integral from a minus to a plus, just both sides of a, f of t delta of t minus a dt. Well, we're integrating really at only one point, so f of t is only evaluated at that one point a. This then is equal to the value of that function at a, which is a constant, so we're going to take it outside the integral, times the integral from a minus to a plus delta of t minus a dt. We've already pointed out that the area or the integral across the delta function is 1. So this integral then becomes 1. And we are left with then f of a. We're going to use this later on in your signals and systems when you get into digital signal processing. We're going to use this process, this sifting property, to actually sample f of t at values of time a and so on. Thus what we've got here is the value of that function at t equals a.